Welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast sponsored by Schneider Electric. This week we're talking about EV charging and in particular the courses around it and section 722 of the wiring regulations. Get involved with the comments and join in the discussion. Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It is me, Mark. We've been away for a few weeks because I've been on holiday. Jamie has had a baby and Craig's been very busy out on site. So it has been a bit of time. I do apologise for the people who've been waiting for an episode to drop. I'm joined tonight by Craig. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Yeah, I'm really good, actually. Just back from my holiday, so I'm I'm absolutely flying today, <laughs> trying to catch up with work. I'm sure you know what it's like when you've had a bit of time off, just catching up with everything and spinning lots of plates. Those uh, floating down the Atlantic or whatever you were doing sounded horrible and hard and challenging at times, mate. Like. Yeah, two nights on a on a cruise out to Bilbao was really hard work with the bar open and nothing much else to do. We've also got Richard with us tonight again. How are you, mate? Are you, thanks for coming back as well. No problem. Looking forward to it. Um, not too bad, thanks. Just getting into the uh, the whole start of um, enrolment back at uh, FE College. New learners coming in, existing learners moving on to level three. Um, trying to keep up myself you know with changes uh in the industry and keep up to date looking forward to uh the alex show meeting some old friends some new friends hopefully um yeah all good all good so fantastic fantastic we've come together tonight to speak about ev charging and section 722 of the regs and a bit of the training around all of that But before we get into that subject I just want to mention about the electrical apprenticeship standard for those people who aren't aware it's currently in draft format it's been reviewed at the minute and there is an opportunity for everybody to feed back their ideas and thoughts on that draft so there's a link in the description to this video and in the description to the podcast if you could please go off and click on that the drafts in question one have a quick read through see what you think it's your opportunity to affect change for the future electrical apprenticeship training for maybe the next 10 years so don't pass it up go and get involved in that please so without further ado We'll jump into the actual issue we're going to discuss. And it was uh, Richard's idea on his podcast when he came on to speak with me. Craig reminded me of it in a chat we were having offline. And we've come together to um, run through EV charging um, training, I guess, is the best way to describe it. So um, what do you want to start with, Richard? Where do you want to go from with this one? Um, Having delivered the training... A few times, City and Guilds 2919, although it's recently changed now. Um, Not only to, or give the, you know, level three apprentices a a bit of an insight as to what it's all about. You know, it's also for electricians as well, because we know that when we're using 7671, the idea of it is that you follow the book. So we'll start in part one, of course, decide whether or not it's, the book covers it and you know, we go through part two anytime if we need to, part three, four, five, six, etc. But anything where there's an increased risk of electric shock due to one thing or another, we're going to find a section within part seven, um, special installations or locations. So, of course, we've got to consider everything from parts one to six, but we've also got to consider the content of section 722, which is purely for vehicle charging. So due to the increased risk of electric shock because of you know the the expansive metal of the car and the car being outside and we've got to consider additional levels of safety but also we've got to consider load load control we've got to consider the earthing uh, system the earthing arrangement we've got to consider maybe new devices we've got to consider protected devices they you know they may be slightly different to what we're used to we've got to consider additional manufacturers instructions we've got to consider um ena notification we've got to consider um other technical standards we might have to buy some new test equipment we're going to have to have some additional columns on our test certification etc to the point where of course the IT have produced a code of practice purely for vehicle charging so this one here hopefully it's going to change soon uh, to amendment two so because of how complex and the number of considerations that we need to take in we've got to consider the code of practice for vehicle charging so 722 within itself you know it doesn't really tell us a lot like most of the book really um so that's why we've got a code of practice that i generally go from front to back uh when i do the course um i have to expand upon a few of the sections in it because again it doesn't tell us a great deal um but there are 
some useful um, uh, websites and things out there to help us, especially the ENA website, Energy Networks Association, where we can access free some of the engineering guidance um, and we can access our uh, DNO notification forms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's not the easiest of sites to navigate, but I always find micro, yeah. you know, the magnifying glass type electric vehicle and you'll get generally all the documents, et cetera. As an uh, installer, I've used that a lot, not just yeah. for the notification form, as you say, but for the actual detail. It is quite good, like you've said. So that's worth going and checking out. And I will pop a link to that in the yeah. description of the video. Just to speak about the course, though, before we move on, it has recently changed, doesn't it? Was it the 2919? And is it now the 2921? And I think they've got extra numbers at the end of it, like they did with 2391. So is it the 31, uh, there are, I think, for the full yeah. shebang? There, there are three versions of. The first version is for small scale. Uh, installations second version is medium scale i think and the third version is large scale so i haven't really looked at the other standards only the the, the small scale version at the moment but crucially the new standard you must you must be uh, a qualified electrician to be able to to do the course basically um yeah because that was one of the things when I put the question out about doing this podcast on social media, a lot of the responses were, well, we've got non-electricians doing these courses because it was kind of left open to the interpretation of training centres, wasn't it? But that's been really yeah. pinched down now. Yeah. Having, Go on, sorry, Craig. Sorry, I was going to say, and having not actually looked at the new standards or qualifications yet, have they specified then what they are classing as an electrician? So what is their electrician requirements for this then? Without yeah. having a document open in front of me, I can't tell you. But a goal card is one option. The experience worker route is another one. It actually does detail and list exactly what is required. So I was looking before the podcast, and that does actually say, like you said, so it's there in black and white for us. I mean, I've got. A, I mean, I was doing another webinar before this one, but I have got a couple of other windows open on my desktop with in a notification G12. My next thing was going to be download a couple of other bits, but then my dad was on the phone, so I didn't get a chance. <laughs> but um, you've also got to consider um, compliance with the law uh, and, as we said, um, you know, electricity work regulations and, and particularly um, Regulation 16, which talks about, you know, you must have uh, adequate technical knowledge and or experience. Uh, and without the technical in-depth guidance that is um, included in the course. I'm not saying all training centres do the same type of training, but certainly what I try to do is spend two days really looking at, you know, the technical requirements following the code of practice, but actually breaking down some of that technical language into simple sparky terms. Uh, it's no good giving the sparks a problem. You need to, 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 to give them what's required, the intent, but also give them a solution to it, you know, and that's, that's, that's what you've got to try and do because, Sparks are sparks, aren't they? They're, they're not all technical people, uh, and certainly when you you know when you're in training, you f you forget that. And I use the book quite freely. I can find a way around it, navigate it, use it because I use it all the time. But then I have to yeah. slow down and think to myself, hold on, you know, you're looking around the room. There's 15, 20 lads in there, and you, they're miles away because they they don't know they're, they don't want to say anything, but they they kind of got lost in some of the technical side of it. So it is the, the art of it is is to try and break it down and, and simplify it out a little bit. So that's what I try and do. Yeah, that's good. I mean, some of the complaints you see around a lot of these courses is you just kind of taught to pass an exam rather than really taught around the subject. And I know some of these things I've been on where the room doesn't have many electricians in even. They're not even oh. from, from industry. So the lecturer, like yourself, is yeah, kind yeah. of trying to deal with that and you're not maybe able to teach in the way you would like because of that. So the fact that they're putting this in there now that we're yes. only going to have electricians on this course, you know, is a helpful thing, I think. And, you know, there seems to be other courses put in place for people who aren't electricians. So obviously it's going to be specifiers and managers and other people who might want some knowledge around electric vehicle charge points. You know, they've got that option there. And I think we should look at that more widely with our regulation courses as well, and even test and inspection. That we need to be well, more protective that, of that. Yeah, let, let's hope that um, this, this is the start of, I mean, once... AAL, City and Guilds, you know, the awarding organisations um, start to do meetings again and things like that. Uh, it will certainly be, you know, some of my feedback will be, you've done that with that particular course. Is this something you'll you be, you be looking to do with, with other courses, you know? Yeah. And I've, just, I've just had a quick look whilst you've been having that conversation, which I agree with all those points on it, is they are looking now at, as an MVQ they require. So whether that's the 
two, three, five, seven, whether that was the experience work of it, whether that was a traditional gold card apprenticeship, yeah. it seems to be that you must be eligible to, whether you get one or not, you must be eligible to be able to gain a gold card to now be allowed to do the EV charging qualification, which yeah. will be interesting. And it's also talking about if you've not done any, if your course, your qualifications are more than five years old, you must be able to evidence that you've maintained an accurate CPD record to then be allowed to take part in the course as well, which seems to be aligning to what the IET and the NIC and NAPA and all these people are starting to say a bit wider in the industry now, isn't it, that you require an MVQ and you must be able to evidence CPD and what you're doing. I know there's a whole host of conversation of yeah. what is CPD, but yeah. it's good that we're starting to, or my opinion anyways, it's good we're starting to kind of ring fence that a little bit and move towards those aspirations it'll be interesting I suppose having sat on both sides of the coin as to how much training providers enforce this and how much then your city and guilds and your EEL are checking the entry requirements of the learners that have undertaken the course and then whether the CPSEs are recognising it if it's not been done in a valid way I think that that whole process will be interesting to see how that plays out yeah, Absolutely. and it's, it's the same old thing with our industry. You know, who polices it? No one. Do they? No one polices anything. I can go to B&Q or Screwfix, buy wherever I like, install it wherever I want, and nobody bats an eye unless there's a fatality or somebody gets injured or killed, and then we'll come up with some, you know, n- new legislation or something. But at least they're trying to recognise that a standard needs to be set um, it's like a base camp, isn't it? That's what yeah. I've referred to it as. It's like we've got this base camp now. And yes. while everybody doesn't entirely agree with that, and there are yeah. some, you know, there are always loopholes to kind of bypass things. And there's people who are going to slip outside of that by no fault of their own. And there does need yeah. to be allowance for that. It's like yeah. a solid base camp that we can work forward with now. And whilst all of the bodies in industry are kind of saying the same things and all of the training centres are playing to the same rules, I think that makes makes it better. That's not my opinion on it anyway as a yeah. contracting electrician. And I agree. And what I would hope is every training centre, City and Girls, EEL, whoever, they get externally moderated every year. So I would hope now the external moderator comes in and says, well, you've delivered this course. Show me how you ensured that they all met the requirements. Failing that, I would then hope that NIC, NAPA, whoever else people go and join would then go, okay, you've managed to do this course. However, we're not going to allow you to do that and sign that off because you've not met the requirements. And I'm probably living in an idealistic world that I often get told, but if everybody does a little bit, yeah, for me, I can only see that it can only make it a bit better than where yeah. we're going at the minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then right. recently, I don't know if you was involved with any of it, Mark, but um, I was shown or given some um, documents where OZEV or whoever it is that funds, obviously the government fund these vehicle charging points where they produced a report about uh, a survey on so many installs, brand new installs, and um, where they found, you know, a number of code ones, code twos, and some code threes. And it was, it was quite horrific, some of the brand new installations, which were either immediately dangerous from one thing or another, potentially dangerous, or, you know, would, would have benefited from improved safety considering they were brand new installs. You know, and there was there was a chap on the course that had been installing vehicle charging points and he, he, he took this report down on the table and he said, you wouldn't believe it. He said, I've been audited for an installation. He said, um, uh, and I'm, I'm with the NIC and I rang my uh, area engineer uh, and I complained and said, well, you know, that picked this and I picked that and whatever. Uh, and he said, I wouldn't mind, but the, the contractor that's been to, to do the assessment or check my work is another NIC uh, approved contractor and some of the codes I put next to some of the stuff I've done is absolutely ridiculous. And he showed me this report and it had photographs of his install. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was un- unbelievable. It was what a mess. But saying that, the contractor that did the, it wasn't a condition report as such, it was a form especially for vehicle charging points. But some of the things he found and some of the coding he gave to it was just ridiculous. So you've got yeah. an NIC contract, and I'm sure it happens with NAPIT, whatever, that has done a really bad install You've then sent another contractor through the same CPS that's done a, a report on it, which equally as bad. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, the government are paying for these installs or contributing towards the, the cost. So they're going to get audited, aren't they? 
But and that... yeah, and this guy he, he couldn't see what he'd done wrong. And it, you know, when you seen the photographs of it, it was it was it was bad. There's but... two there's two elements of bad things in what you've just said there. One is that the the survey itself to me is worthless because it was done you know, poorly. The people doing the audits weren't doing them fairly or they weren't competent to do them. I've seen some and they're horrendous. Yeah. Um, there's been codes given that definitely weren't codes to do with fire security um, and even securing the cable that leads to the vehicle. It was it was daft, some of them. And then like you say, there is issues within those installs as well. And we see those every day on social media with some of the pictures that are shared with these dog rough EV yeah. installs. We know it happens. It's not something that anyone's trying to hide from. But I think when um, OZEV have got involved, and there's obviously a budget that they've got yeah. to spend to have these audits done, they maybe didn't have the funding that was needed to get them done in as thorough a version as we would have might have liked to have seen for that to be worth something, I guess, without sounding too harsh. Um, so it is, it is difficult. And I, I maintain this. I've had this discussion with Neil before that, you know, installing an electric vehicle charge point for a competent electrician isn't that difficult you know it's it's quite a simple radial circuit with a heavy load on the end all of the extra considerations to do with safety around the product itself and its use yeah. and a lot of these products now have a lot of that technology built in but one of the other things i want us to talk about tonight is how that maybe doesn't marry up with what the intent of our regulations are you know in, in specifics you know i know this is an installing electrician that some of the RCD protection that's inside some of these charge points where it's claimed to have type A RCD protection. So the full intent of our regulations, it doesn't actually meet that. I think it's to do with the mechanical operation of the RCD and the test buttons and, and things like that. But yet the marketing on the product will say type A RCD protection. And then you go off on social media and, and you'll read that manufacturer saying, well, actually, if you're going to be audited by the NIC, you might want to put a type A RCD up front of the product. And then there's other manufacturers who are saying, we know our RCD doesn't necessarily comply with that. So in the instructions, it will state it should have a type A RCD. But on the promotional marketing, it says type A RCD included. So you can kind of see from an electrician's point of view, you've been stitched up a little bit from the start. So when these audits get carried out, you can be pulled up for something and it can feel very harsh. But as a so, contractor yourself, how are you supposed to price for that? How are you supposed to be, you know, fair uh and you know whatever you, to the to the customer you go and give them a, a you know an estimate of quotation on it based on facts from the manufacturer then you have to go back and so oh, i'm very sorry mrs smith but actually i've now got to put this additional enclosure another device blah 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 you know it's 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 not yeah. good. we got caught out by that recently i weren't in the manufacturer we installed some of their three phase posts that yeah. had the required rcds inside them um, I specified some wall-mounted products that I assumed were the same, but the RCDs inside those weren't of the same construction. We had to fit four pearl three-phase RCDs in front of them, which obviously had additional cost, as you've said. And, and because that was my mistake, you know, in, in specifying it, I didn't put the research in that I should have done. We fronted yeah. that cost. And I'm sure there's contractors around the country who've made that same yeah. honest mistake. But as long as you hold your hands up to that and do something about it, it happens with all kinds of things in the electrical yes. industry. And you kind of work that into the risk of any job you are pricing. But yeah, it's it's a really difficult position, I think, that we're in with some of that. It started with the earth rods, and then it seems yeah. to have moved more towards RCDs. And yeah, yeah. I think those manufacturers could help us out a bit more. And it seems a lot of the time we're always, you know, as people are trying to catch us out, that's how it feels. Us ever trying to catch us out. The CPSs are trying to catch us out. Yeah. Because of the rogues that are out there and the genuine contractors, you know, suffering the consequences of that, I think. I think even when you look at that from, I suppose you've got to then start to trust one or two manufacturers and really you can only kind of specify that, which then from your point of view is positive for your business. But from a customer's point of view, that might not be giving them what they want based on the fact that it's so complicated out there. And it just reminds me a bit, as you say, of like RCDs conversations about, are they double pole? Are they single pole? Are they single pole with switch neutral? Are they solid neutrals? Like, there's so many conflicting bits of information about whether it is or isn't what is compliant. It's just making it harder for the everyday practice and the electrician. And let's be honest, when we're on site every day, we don't have the four, five, six, seven, eight hours in a week or whatever it may be to research every install that needs to be. And no, it's only that person at the end point is going to get pulled up and. I agree that things should be audited. I agree that things should be inspected, but I also agree we should give people half a chance to do the job they want to do well. 
and it just seems a bit muddy for me that this whole EV section at the minute. Yeah, I, I yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And and do contractors still rely on the knowledge of the wholesaler? Not to say that the wholesaler knows everything, but certainly back when I used to use my local wholesaler quite regularly, if you, if you needed something specific for a job, you'd say, look, I need so and so so and so and so, and they'd yep, yep, no, no. and they'd sort it for you. Is that still the case, or is it? I think at a domestic level, you would definitely still get that. Um, there's still contractors who will go in and have them do things like lighting design, for example, yeah. because they don't yeah. feel they've got the competence of that. Um, and yeah. certainly with EB products, I would assume yeah. a lot of domestic contractors will rock up and say, this is what I'm installing. You know, Is there something on the shelf or something you'd recommend to get in? Because it's new to a lot of contractors. Yeah. This is yeah. something else that you know we're not maybe acknowledging, that there's only still a niche portion of the industry that are carrying out EV installs. Lots of electrical contractors still haven't gone anywhere near them i speak to quite a few on social media every week who were saying i've seen you installing ev products you know what would you recommend what's some good training to go on i've had those conversations while i've been away on holiday even so you know it's something that's still building and i think it's important we get those people on the right training courses with people like you guys at the end yeah. of the day so they can get that get that knowledge get the support from the manufacturers as well and the wholesale network there is more to be done i think yeah, um, yeah. because ultimately it is that simple circuit all of the complications seem to come around the dno notifications the g12 forms yeah. the specification of the actual product understanding where product standards and our own wiring standards if you like crossover and which ones supersede the other maybe the iet coming out and saying well the standards that these EV manufacturers or the conformities, as you said before, Richard, uh, are above and beyond ours in the electrical industry, and we can accept that. Or that they're not, and we can't accept it, and we have to keep doing this. It's that muddy grey area I think we need to get cleared up. And I think it's it's about how you approach it, isn't it? It's so going back to Rich's question. One that we've got is if we're not um, sure on something that's coming forward, we actually get a wholesaler to put us in touch with the technical specialist of the manufacturer that we are working with so that you can have that conversation and have that, like, this is my understanding. What are you thinking? Okay, you think that. Tell me why you think that. Where do we go next? How do we come to a common ground? And then you've kind of got a basis of, even if you don't want to sit and read the book and you don't want to memorise all the regulations, I get that. But a conversation on a phone call, driving between jobs in a van or whatever it might be, like push your wholesaler to give you that support because they can put you in touch with the people that they are talking to to help you understand what that job is going, I think is quite a key way that I do it anyway. That's how I function. I need to talk to people and go through the step by steps. And they're usually quite willing to have those conversations for what I'm aware of. Well, if they, if they want you to install their product and you to purchase that product, then they've, they've got to be able to engage with you, that, you know, from a technical side, haven't you? And certainly with some of the charges that I've come across, you know, you need some time to understand the programming and the menu system, you know, because they're not a simple press this, press that. It's hold this for two seconds, press that, link it up, you know, with the, 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 the internet, um, link it with the app you need to explain to the, the client how to use it, you know, it, well, one, one, one example that I had a while ago, and it may have changed by now, but I remember talking to my energy. Yeah, and yeah. A conversation I had with them was about installing the CTs. And you know how you join the Cat6 cable and the CTs together and everything else. And I was saying, so can I make that junction inside the consumer unit? And they're like, because I'd seen it on social media. I've not installed a lot of EV chargers. So I thought, I want to have this conversation. And they told me in that call, it only complies inside the consumer unit if it's done by through crimps or the old jelly crimps. If you put it in Wagos, it wasn't compliant with the manufacturer's standards. And I thought, I've seen a lot of Wagos in consumer units with their... Uh, and I just thought, without that conversation, I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah, you wouldn't know. This is this is why it's, the, it's fundamental that you have that technical conversation with them to understand exactly what's required and what's not. Because some of the technical manuals that come with some of these charges are great but then you've got a user manual and then you've got a programming manual you have to try and align all of the documents together to get a straightforward easy sparky install book is how i see it you know and some of them are that specific zappy one at least one of them where even the the torque screws to hold the lid on to maintain that ip rating they're all they've all got a set torques rating you know even the little fiber washers that come with the screws to fix the thing to the wall 
you know yeah. you have to, you, you have to consider all of that and, it, and, it, and if the enclosure is ip68 you've got to use an ip68 rated gland so you've got to use a storm gland or something because as soon as you you know compromise that ip rating of that box with all those electronics in it and some of it which you rely upon for life for safety and it goes tits up then you've you, your warranty is going to be void isn't it because you haven't installed as per the technical manufacturer's recommendations there's so much you've got to consider there isn't it got, sorry so, greg go on, go on greg say, you've got to hope that the worst thing you're worried about is your warranty in that situation isn't it or yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, we're just starting to see now as we're re revisiting some of these earlier installs, kind of the longevity of these products yeah. and the, the actual integrity of the units in terms of, you know, moisture getting into them, my experience has been really good. A lot of the EV manufacturers seem to have, have got that, you know, quite quite well nailed down. Some of the earlier products, I won't mention the brand, but they were there was one that was awful, but the rest seemed to be very very good and and the the my energy zappy is one of the better ones i've been to, back to lots of those and they are dry as a burn as long as you do follow those instructions and and the use of wagers you know it's such a good point they're often used way out of side their um, instructions in general electrical systems how many times do we see them outside of the the boxes that are supposed to hold them in place for the minute and it's free rating even using them inside a consumer unit loose in the back to join your your 230 volt cables you know you've got to think about all of these things in more ways than you ever would perhaps imagine. And I've been guilty of using where goes on the CTs within consumer units. We had the issue to start with, with your cat cable. And if it was rated for the right voltage, yeah. you can purchase that. So it is. So we now, we now do that on our installs. That was a learning curve because it wasn't something we were familiar with. Yeah. Um, and I think there's all those things we need to get into wider discussion. And perhaps that should be covered on the courses. You know, you're saying about the, the ENA forms and the G12 forms and the discussion around understanding conformities and things. I don't expect that that's in the training syllabus for any of these courses. It's up to individual lecturers like yourselves to perhaps include it. Is that is that fair to say or is it part of the syllabus? No, uh, it's, it's well, you know, the, 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 the new version of that City and Girls College changed now where there is... Um, there's a written paper in it where they've got to do a cable cult from start to finish. And there's some generic questions about mode of charge and things like that. Um, but with the old version of it, there was an online exam, 40 questions based upon the code of practice where some of the answers weren't even in the code of practice, some generic testing questions, well, which you'd find obviously in the guidance note or the regs. And then the second part of it was where you, you were given um, like two or three uh, plans of where a vehicle charger was to be installed and you had to randomly pick one of these designs and then you had to pick a charger. Uh, it give you the length of run and it was like a mini cable calc and then you had to fill out um, an ENA form for that. Um, you had to fill out all the, the uh, forms, um, pre-installation forms and risk assessment if you was putting a rod in, et cetera, in the back of the code of practice. Uh, and a, uh, an EIC to go with one of the installs. There was also uh, an install that you were supposed to do as well. So you, you were supposed to have uh, or install a bit of SWA between a consumer and, and a charge point. There was a bit of a practical element to it, which you could never do. So they kind of took that away. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't the, the, the best of qualifications. The new one, yeah, it's a little bit better. But yeah, you know, you have to fill in so many gaps with, with some of these standards. To, to give them the best information or knowledge that you I guess can. I guess if they're starting from the base point that everyone attending that course is electricians installing something like a steel wire armor cable isn't something that should need covering to be honest no, should it it should be a, a given that that's known yeah exactly so I didn't spend my time doing that because I'm going to you know teach you how to suck eggs at the end of the day you yeah. know you, I don't need to see you doing that I'd rather spend that extra hour or two navigating through the ENA website to get you to the correct forms and the correct DNO for your area and how to, you know, um, yeah. send the form, get, get the information on the cutout view size, clarify the earthing arrangement, all that type of stuff is more beneficial, pointing them towards the um, very useful document on there, the mock one about, you know, your different types of cutouts. So, you know, some of the younger sparks out in industry might not have seen biscuit type cutouts, some of the old switch neutral, fuse neutrals. You know, there's so much good information there. Um, to, to help them and you know a lot of them or some of them use it for like toolbox talks if they were you know the qs for, for their for their lads on site so there's so much stuff you could do but there's never enough time to to get across everything you want to if that you know so 
even though we had, I built a, in COVID, in lockdown, I built a, an EV charging area, basically, where I had 10 different charges. I never finished it all, but 10 different charges. And I replicated, you know, different earthing arrangements to try and give them a practical, um, you know, installation of what different installations might look like and how you'd, you know, get, a, 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 you know, um, different solutions to different types of situations you know what I mean to try and give them an idea of you'd fit this there you'd fit that there and then you'd have conversations about other parts of the regs that they should already have knowledge of you know SPDs for instance uh, AFDDs you could argue that an AFDD would would have been highly recommended due to the possibility of overheating an arc in plugging in and out you know the type two or type three sockets you know and the, the lead across the floor when you're charging the car all that type of stuff uh, and if you're relying upon um, one of these, you know, open devices and we've got no way of testing these devices because they don't make an open device tester. And I'm certainly not going to go to the cutout and cut the pen conductor to see if it works. So are you relying upon that device for someone's life? Well, if you are, then as per, you know, chapter 43, uh, 44, um, it, it's got to have a, 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 a surge protection device to protect it to protect the electronics in it from going you know tits up if is a, if there's a transient so there should you know all these things should be part of their existing knowledge but they're not so you have to go back you know into the regs and say look if you consider this this and ah oh, right i see what you're saying now yeah i didn't even realize that etc cetera, etc cetera. so th there is a lot to to consider and there's a few things you mentioned there which just bypass us generally in the day isn't there like conversations of people not knowing what type of SPDs they need to install, never mind like how uh, they commit. And yeah. going back to what seems to be the ongoing current Milky Bar conversation about do you put AFDDs in or not? And that whole, well, you should be in a different statement with a new table compared to the well, recommendation if you want to. Like, I think there's going to be some great times ahead where people are having to justify that should, and having spoken to quite a few people, them saying that actually the intent of the regs is for you to justify why you haven't, rather than just ignoring it, thinking it's not something you need to pay attention to yet. And the same with SPDs, isn't it? They took the risk assessment away, so now you've got to kind of justify why you're not, because the charge of itself is worth more than the, what, 50 or £100 pound or whatever it's going to cost for the SPD now, so you're You've lost that argument. Where will yeah. you go next on that line as to why you justify that you shouldn't be installing it? And it's, I think there's movement are coming, but there's, as you say, a lot of learning needs to happen to get that movement to go in the right way. Yeah. Okay. It's almost like it's a hot tub conversation resurfaced again in an EV <laughs> charger. There is a lot of that. I mean, a lot of these products now seem to be getting the surge protection built in. I assume the Type 3 within the product itself. So it does seem to be manufacturers are reacting to some of this and trying to put as much of the technology as they can in the product but we still obviously have to consider what we should be doing as part of the general wiring system as we normally would as you said right at the start of this richard looking at all of the parts of the wiring regs and not just 722 no. so there, there there is that you know wider issue around knowledge shall we say within the electrical industry and i think that's probably been caused through a decade or more of perhaps poor training and um, entry routes into industry and now you know, if we're seeing that more clearly within the EV space than anywhere else, because government seem to be so keenly focused on that. And I guess it's because of the extra load that's going onto the infrastructure. Um, and also the fact that they're seeing this as perhaps safety critical. So they're more involved in that. And it's, you know, more in the public domain. But these issues are more historical, I think, than just EV. I yeah, mean, you're it's not just an area. Overnight. And it's not it's not something that's happened overnight. This this has been going on for a long time hasn't it where you know you've got short courses and all the rest of it. it's another conversation for another day but <laughs> you're not going to fix it by moaning about it you're going to try and fix it by doing things like this which i hope will be quite beneficial uh and you know we could probably do another one and another one and another one if there's areas specifically that they want a bit more information on um and i only know what i know because of talking to you know great people like yourselves and Gaz and other people within industry that I've known for a long time to try and interpret the intent of the regs. Basically, that's 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 what we're trying to do. You know, I do think that the IET 
could do a little bit more sometimes because it makes me laugh when I go to LX and places like that where you have a panel and you have the IT and you'll have um, somebody from the NIC and you'll have somebody from NAPIT, et cetera. And there'll be a question asked and then, you know, one of the IT will say, oh, well, let's go to the NIC and find out what they think. Well, hold on. You sit on JPAL. You, you wrote it, you lot. You tell us what the intent is. It's up to you to tell us, you know. So it's a shame, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep working and keep doing what we what we can do. I mean, I like the 18th when that came out. That cleared a few things up. Um, and then, you know, in our amendment two, it's, it's, it's a lot better, I think. I don't know if you find it better, Mark, to never go through as a contractor, but I certainly think they've, they have listened and they have, you know, improved certain parts and made it easier. And they have defined recommendation and, you know, uh, other, other in that table in, in part one, et cetera. So it is better. Yeah, we spoke about that on this this podcast um, at the time. We, you know, I think it is much improved. Yeah, I, I, like um, it. I, I think it's the best version of the wiring rig since the 16th edition. That's as much as my knowledge goes back to. I don't predate that, but it's certainly one of the better versions of the regs I've seen. One of the things I would say about about training, rather than producing courses, you know, based on multiple choice exams and whatever, I think a better way of looking at it would be to identify what some of the problems are in those certain areas so with ev installs some of the things we see is a lack of knowledge around the you know specific abilities of a product the manufacturer's side of it um and then perhaps the competence and skills of the abilities of some of the people doing the installs who aren't maybe practicing electricians and are just in training to kind of fix those issues rather than you know just saying this is the course go and take it and i do think in what's happening now it seems to be that that is the case that they've kind of looked at this and seeing there were non-electricians getting qualified as you know EV installers and and going off installing EV charge points after a few weeks training, so they've kind of cut that out, and now we're starting to see more of an encouragement towards reading into manufacturers, you know, training at CPD. So there does seem to be a bit of a push in the right direction. And I yeah. think part of the problem is also that. People want more training, they want higher standard of training, but don't necessarily always want to pay for that. So if Richard turns around and says, tell you what, I'll give you the best EV charging course in the world, but it's five days off work, not the two days it's recommended by City and Guilds, and it's going to cost you £1,000, not £400, sadly, I don't think the uptake would be there in the way that it Such needs Such a good point. <laughs> yeah. So... Richard can sit and make them, and I only know this from sat there trying to think, do you know what? I'm going to do the best lesson ever next week. And then you get there and nobody's there. You know, it's, you know, it's so hard that we've got to have a hunger from an industry point of view to want to invest in themselves, to invest in that training. So that Richard's is not sitting there building 10 charging bays through COVID and then six people want to pay for the time to understand the learning. And it's how we get that whole industry shift which i think we spoke about before of everybody playing a part and maybe it is a partnership with manufacturers and organizations to say well it doesn't need to cost a thousand pound because if x product has been taught and trained and delivered and then that's what people are knowing we're going to see that back in sales so we're going to fund an element of this so we're going to help with an element of that you know who better and no disrespect to any lecturer, but who better to have a technical product manufacturer coming in on one of the days to talk through their product and say why it complies with all of these things, having been the people designing and building it. And that's not just an EV charging for me. That should be wider across the whole of education and training. But we've got to, it's a real hard balance, I guess, for training to be, well, at what point are people willing to do some learning and then hopefully go away and carry on with learning and what point are they not and I think that not is when you start taking too much money out of people's pockets whether that's days at work yeah, cost of course, cost of products you know I, well the regs is the biggest argument every every couple of years when an amendment comes out isn't it what another £90, another £100 for a book yep. a £1,000 on the best course in the world is not going to be that appealing I don't think very true. Yeah, very, very true. It's where you see the value in it, I think, isn't it? If you've got something that offers value, people will pay for it. But it's, um, you know, we're saying all these things about, you know, the regs are saying that it's a, it's a, sh it's a should now and you've got to say why it's not. But if the marketplace isn't accepting that, mm 
if the marketplace is paying no attention to their eggs and they're still carrying on as normal, which is what I'm seeing out there all the time. People aren't installing AFDDs on EV charge points in domestic properties. It's just not happening. And it won't happen after September, I don't think, whatever the regulations are saying in, inside it, because the marketplace isn't viewing that as you should be doing this. And if you're not, you need to explain why. They're saying, well, you know, it's saying advising it. You know, you can do it, but you don't have to. That's still the mentality that's out there. So unless we take industry on that journey and firmly explain what that actually does mean and have that, you know, made clear by the IET, I guess, yeah. I don't think we're going to get to that place. And then there's going to be contractors who are trying to, to meet that and essentially price themselves out of work. And they drop by the wayside. And is what you end up with is some of the contractors who were maybe termed as, I don't know, less ethical or less competent. I don't know how you want to want to phrase it, who are getting all of the work and surviving. And the ones who are perhaps trying to be more, you know, playing by the rules, I suppose, are falling to the wayside. You see those complaints on social media all of the time. I know it does happen. There are contractors who folded through the course of time due to pat testing and fixed wire testing and all these other things that have gone on in the past. I think it's something that we really need to drill down into now with training, with the IET, and get that sorted so the marketplace reacts to what industry is telling it. Yeah, just got to, as you say, got to keep trying and, and fight the fight because, you know, there's always going to be, you know, B&Q Dave isn't it, down the road. That's <laughs> happened to me many, many times. You know, can you come and have a look at this? Uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing this or doing that. Okay, let's come have a little bit of a server. Well, you've got to have this upgraded. We've got to change that. Got to do this before I can do anything. Oh, well, well don't worry about it then because, you know, our, our, our friend Joe around the corner said he, he can come and do that. No problem. You can't compete with that, can you? And then you yeah. get a phone call a few months later to say, you know, that trippy thing you put in under the stairs, the trippy thing, it just keeps every now and again, it, the thing just goes off. Uh, you know, can you come and have a look? And you, well, you'll have to get, well, you won't answer his phone now. So it's a wider issue, isn't it? It's it's a... and, and that's that's been on that for years because the industry just isn't policed. Nobody polices anything. And I, I don't know how they would police it. Maybe a license, a bit like gas safe, maybe, where you can't actually buy any products unless you can prove that you are sufficiently, you know, trained, suitably skilled, experienced and all that, some form of license that enables you to buy electrical products. Mm. Until they do that, you, you, you'll never stop it, um, you know, so. Uh, I think we all want that nice, easy solution, yeah. don't we? But if you speak to the gas safe guys, they'll tell you that yeah. it's still an issue in their industry. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, the only real solution is that long-term thing of increasing the quality of training that's happening yeah. right from the very start across the board. And it does take time. There is no real magic bullet, I don't think, other than that and patience, in, in my view. Yeah. And as and I would say to, to my guys or girls, whatever, you, you can only do the job the best that you can following the guidance that's there. It doesn't matter what everybody else does. You know, don't worry about, well, I've never seen that done on site. I've never done that. You know, we don't do that on site. We do this, whatever, whatever. That's fine. But if anything ever was to happen, you need to make sure that you've done everything you can to comply with the law, you know, and the law is electricity at work regulations, isn't it? And above that, Health and Safety at Work Act, which, you know, both relate to a code of practice, which is, of course, 7671, isn't it? That's It's there. <laughs> As the minimum standard to ensure safety if you don't want to follow it or ignore it then that's fine but when something goes wrong then you've got to explain why you haven't done that so and i i love that conversation with students that say so as bs 761 statutory non statutory and you go it's non statutory and you go but is it really yeah. because if you don't do it yeah there is a bigger fish coming down to bite it because yes officially that book is non statutory but everything in it is to help you comply with the statutory element of the regulation. So is it actually non-statutory? And you just watch them kind of go, hmm, that can still get me in trouble if I don't do it. So therefore, why don't we just treat it as statutory? Why do we treat it as it's not? Because it is effectively, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. That is something that could be cleared up with one stroke of a pen by certain people. <laughs> to be honest, they could make it a statutory document. But that's a, that's another discussion for a, another day. Um, to pull this back onto the, to the EV, yeah. <laughs> EV, EV side of things, yeah. um, you know, what would you say are the, the, the pitfalls of that course that people can look out for? Some of the general things that you perhaps think are missing well, within the well, normal aspects of training that we can plug some of those gaps maybe? There's certain areas that you've, you've got to make sure you've got a, a good knowledge of. Um, and between 
the 18th and Amendment 1, they made a change to maximum demand and diversity. So they made an allowance uh, in 722.311.201, and they start talking about load curtailment. And when this first changed, I thought to myself, curtailment, what, what they're talking about there. So I tried to have an understanding of what it is they're talking about. So what they're trying to say is if there's a way of controlling the load somehow, because it's not like a, a shower maybe or a cooker where you draw in a lot of current for a short duration, maybe a cooker a bit longer, but you know, with a, with a vehicle charge, a 32 amps, you're not talking about 10 minutes or 20 minutes like a shower or even an hour. You're talking for hours of continuous 32 amps, 32 amps. And you've got to consider that we can't, or we're not allowed to apply diversity to that, like underfloor heating and other you know, types of load because it's drawing that current for that, or all, all of that current for that, for that time. So prior to this change in the regulations, if we only had, you know, a 60 amp cutout fuse, 60 amp supply, and we'd already got 40 amps, you know, existing demand, um, we couldn't put a charger in a 32 amps, we couldn't do it. We'd either have to get a 16 amp charger or some of them you can turn the charge rate down, but then you've got to explain to the customer that, you know, you're going to leave your car on charge for five hours and you were thinking you're going to get 200 miles. You know, you're only going to get 100 miles. We might not be able to install it at all. So they made a change to this to say that if, if we've got a way of controlling the load somehow, we may take that into account when determining whether or not we can install this charger in that installation. So some of the chargers, most of them probably now, have the ability to monitor the load generally via a CT clamp. So certainly the ones that I've installed, you may get it with the charge. It might be a separate little bit of kit uh, that you have to buy separately uh, or another box of tricks and another bit of kit, normally via a CT clamp, where you can then tell the charger that you've only got 60 amp supply fuse. It will then monitor the load and it will adjust the charge rate according to the load. So in theory, you can never go above your 60 amp fuse and cause it to melt and get hot and set on fire. So that was a good change, I thought, uh, within Amendment 1 to 7671. But then it goes back to the manufacturer to find out whether or not their charger can do it. And do I need extra equipment to buy when I buy the charger? Do I need an extra box of tricks? Do I need to get you know, a Cat 6 or a Cat 5 or, or a paired connection to it? Um, do I have to run a separate one? Can I get a combined cable like something from you know Doncaster Cables at Ultra EV? Is it uh, going to be a non-standard cable? I've got to consider that because it's probably not recognised by Appendix 4 of the regs. So it would be, you know, a, um, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? I've been talking regs all day. It would be, you'd have to note it down on you, sir, as a... Um, you were. Departure. departure. Yeah, a departure because it's not recognised by the regs. So anybody that was coming to look at that installation after might say, well, that's dangerous because you've got band one and band two in the same cable, blah, blah, blah. So you've got to consider that. Um, and if you can get some kind of low control, then it's, it's a good consideration, you know, that you can take into account. But you might need to consider, obviously, the extra bits and pieces, different types of cables, et cetera. So that was a good change, I well, thought. But, but, and just for us, we're on that, talking about loads and metering. Yeah. It's quite often missed at the minute from what I see about the fact that the government actually changed the law that they now all have to be metered chargers to be able to be monitored by the DNO yeah. because of their future plans and how they want to do and how that's going to start to come back. We already have to do that with part L of the building regs, don't we, about metering light and power. Yeah. Now we've got to start metering chargers. It makes me wonder where the world is going to be in the future of the DNO going... Craig's used too much electricity today. Let's turn his house off. He's had enough. <laughs> no, it's that sort of like... <laughs> but there, there is going to be a time, Yeah, because there is going to be a time where, you know, your local transformer substation on your estate is, is going to start overheating and melting. I mean, mm. there, there is a website, I forget what it's called now, where you can go and find out the actual demand at particular times of the day for your local network. But, you know, if everybody all of a sudden installs a 32-amp charger on your estate and there's 100 houses on your estate, then at a particular time when you get home from work, probably not with the current electricity prices, blah, 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 but you, you, you're going to have, you're going to start to have a lot of problems. So yeah, they're yeah. going to control it somehow, but at the same side, at the same time, they're trying to get us to buy an electric car or electric van or whatever it is, but they don't know good if you can't charge it. 
you wouldn't no. have a mobile phone if you can't charge a thing, would you? It's no, still- that's yeah. the delay window they're trying to incorporate, isn't it? And you've raised that point. That was one of the questions I got asked about a looped supply. So if you're on a yeah. looped supply, 60 amp head, can you still install an EV charge point? This was somebody asking the question. And, and you raised the point about the, the statement in the regs and how that all changed in Amendment 1. A lot of the energy um, distributors, DNOs, have yep. their own rules. So if you come across a 60 amp service head, my best advice is to get in touch with them and seek permission before you install anything. Yep. And they will usually allow you to do it on a short term basis, as long as it's got load limiting, load curtailment technology, and that you limit its maximum charge rate until they've attended sites carry out upgrade works, because they are obliged to do that. That's one of the things yep. people aren't aware of. They do need to carry out unlooping um, and upgrading of service heads if it's needed to allow people to have EV infrastructure installed. But yeah, like you said there, when you come to sort of a transformer level and that needs upgrading and making bigger, the cost side of that is astronomical. Right. Um, so the, there is that can that's been kicked down the road. And I know they say that for kind of every litre of gasoline that's produced, it uses a certain amount of electricity that equates to what the vehicles would use anyway. That's all well and good in the high voltage network in the grid. There's probably capacity in there for it, but a local level, it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? And, you know, you see it when there's fuel shortages and everyone goes to turn up to the local petrol station at the same time, panic buying petrol and diesel. You know, the system crashes and breaks. I think when we're all on electric vehicles and we're at home coming back from work at five o'clock on a night, we might see instances of that. And that's why this technology is there to kind of buffer the network against it, I suppose. And of course, that. Always... Have... Yeah, go on. Sorry, Craig. Sorry, I was going to say, I have heard of, and I can't remember the country that's doing it now, but they're doing um, like petrol stations where you drive in and you basically get a whole new battery pack given to you. So you just swap out the battery pack and then that gets charged and off you go with your new station. And it'll be interesting to see where the technology goes if that's what we start to develop as some sort of central charging garages, if you like, that you lock up and you pay your fee and you get a new pack installed in the back of your car and off you go. And um, yeah, as, as I was going to say, this this is going to be constantly evolving and changing. So, you know, because it's got to, um, and I know that there was a change, wasn't there, this year? Was it June or whenever it was when they changed the the standard for uh, vehicle charging equipment that they, they, they have to do certain things now, don't they? I'm, I haven't got that involved with it since then. Um, but it's, it, it is something you need to keep you on top of. But certainly when that change came out to the regulations, you know, to allow for the fact if it does have a way of monitoring the load, it, we, you know, we don't have to necessarily worry about full load. We can, we not so much diversity, but we can take it into account ultimately so we don't melt the cut out. That, that, was, that was the idea of that. And I thought that was a decent consideration, but not all chargers can do it. Some you need to have additional bits of kit and, separately, you know. And that's always the interesting point in talking about loop supplies and transformers and how we start to link that to PME, because we know it's very likely that the DNOs are going to want to PME everything. And the consideration points that have to be added into a PME system to be allowed to plug an EV charging system into it is often, in my opinion, misunderstood or misconstrued as to how we comply with that and what impact that may be having on manufacturers is quite a big gap, I think. Yeah, especially yeah. when there's no product standard as such for that PME fault nah. detection because that leads you into one of my favorites when it talks about your earthing arrangement in particular obviously pme tncs uh it talks about 722.411.4.1 if we've got pme and in the guidance um code of practice it actually says unless we can get it in writing off the dno that that earthing arrangement is tns and it's guaranteed tns and it will it's guaranteed to remain tns you've got to treat it as being PME because they generally are, aren't they? And if it's PME, we know we've got a problem because 722.411.41 says a PME earthing facility shall not be used as the sole means of earthing for the protective conductor contact of a charging point that's located outdoors or where you can reasonably expect to charge the vehicle outdoors unless one of the following methods is used. So prior to Amendment 2, we had five options. We've now only got four options because I've got rid of option one, which was for a balanced three phase system. But never ever going to be perfectly balanced. No. <laughs> Good luck <laughs> with that. <laughs> yeah. Option two talks about supplementing that um, earthing system with an earth electrode system as a mad calculation that we can do. 
etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, dependent upon um, the load um, touch voltage is 70 volts etc but generally depending upon the load you're looking for a value of below kind of one ohm you know mega low and it would have to be uh, stable and reliable at one ohm or less and you can never probably achieve that you might be able to, but generally you can't can you it talks about the underground supplies and metallic pipes if you're talking domestically and you know how you're going to miss the other services and the back feed, which often starts to get people confused. And like how do we know? Because we're not surveying under the ground, right? No, you, you don't know where this. No. So generally, you can't comply with two. So that left three other options, uh, which relies upon a device, this new device, which generally is a voltage monitoring device um, that's built in either to the equipment, an option, or a separate box of tricks. But because we don't carry around this open device tester because they don't manufacture one there is uh, a couple of notes that go with these options three four and five so the first thing you've got to determine it is if you've got a tncs earthing system or pme and you're going to buy a charger and within the charging manufacturer's instructions it says that it's got an open device or a device where you don't need an earth rod etc the first thing you've got to consider is or find out from the manufacturer is as to which indent, so either 3, 4, and 5, 3, 4, or all 5, to 722, 411.4.1, their device complies with. That's difficult to try and get that information to start with. If you can find out which one they're claiming it complies with, there is then a note under that, which refers to, obviously, Section 511 in the regs, which talks about uh, the safety requirements for the construction of electrical equipment. And as we know, Electrical equipment doesn't come under the scope of 7671. So this equipment, this new bit of kit that these manufacturers have developed, how do we know the thing's going to work? Because we can't test it. So it says where the equipment to be used, of course, is not covered by a British or harmonised standard, or if there is no British or harmonised standard for the functionality of a piece of equipment used, it is the responsibility of the electrical installation designer or other person responsible for specifying the installation to establish that. First one, the equipment meets the uh, requirements of electrical equipment safety regulations, uh, 2016, and the electromagnetic compatibility regulations, and any other relevant legislation. And that equipment has either a CE, UKCA, UK NI mark, and has a declaration of conformity, where third party approval is required. The equipment is marked appropriately. It then goes on to say the declaration of conformity, we must append that to the certification for the initial verification. So to try and get this declaration of conformity off the manufacturer is difficult. But if we don't, we have not complied with the regs because it's in our book. So we can't ignore it. Yeah, you made, you made that point on the podcast we did um, a few yeah. weeks ago, Richard, and, and it is it's something that we don't often consider as electricians because like we said earlier on in this podcast, you see it in the market of material, open detection, the unicorn yep. device, whatever we want to call it, yep. that it's got it built in. And a lot of people will take that at face value and that you've complied with the intent of the regs by ensuring you selected a product that, that claims to have it. But yeah, perhaps we need to be putting more research into the fact that does it have the right conformancy certificate? Are they going to provide it? I mean, I know having chatted with you last time i asked a few yeah. manufacturers to produce to provide me with that and to be fair to be fair to them two of them did two yeah. of them did so it can be done um i've got a couple but not all the rest of them just ignored me and my yeah. advice then was to the sparks that were on that particular course you take that how you will but if you don't provide it because it's now a requirement you must attach that to your eic if you don't have that you haven't complied with the regs and if that device does not work and a lot of things would need to happen at a particular time for somebody to get killed touching that car while it was charging. It probably never happened. But if it ever did, and that device didn't open as it should within a certain time, and that person's dead, it will come back to you as the installer because you must, you should have made sure, first of all, that you have that declaration of conformity. If you've got it, and the manufacturer said, and I, I do have a couple of them still, and it says that they take sole responsibility for it, the manufacturer, then that's lovely because that's come off me and onto them. So it's up to them then in a court of law to go and show that they've had third party testing done on it and it complies with electric yeah. equipment safety regulations and all that jazz. Because we I don't know, get 
you know. I, I know with one product that's external to the EV yes. charge point, so I'm happy to mention it's the the Matty. Product, yeah, yeah. But they come with a, a conformity certificate inside yeah. them now. It wasn't That's always the case, but they, they, they do have that in there now. And I've seen some of the more recent ones as well, where they have a little test feature in. And rather than dropping out the, the pen conductor, I think it drops away the line conductor or L1 if it's a free phase system. And it um, switches the, the pen fault contactor, I guess, whatever we're going to call it, into the off position. But yep. the auto reset as well when they detect that fault's cleared. And that's something that's upset a few people because obviously we don't like auto resetting devices with RCDs and MCBs and such. But I guess with the pen fault detection, if the fault's cleared and it's reset itself and there's a fail safe on that, um, that's acceptable. But it comes back to product standards again. I think they do yeah. need to have a product standard for this put in place. And from discussions I've had around industry, that is happening. That, But it obviously has a process of time. Yeah. You know, there's a window of these things. This is a fast moving technology. It's only really been out two or three years and perhaps need a little bit of patience on that. But hopefully it's coming yeah. and that problem will be solved. But the guys at Matthew are very helpful, actually. I've had a few conversations with them over the years. Uh, Richard um, Winter, I think, isn't it, his name? Yeah, I was going to pop, because they're in Litchfield, they're not far from it. I was going to pop and have a look at their facilities, but I never got around to doing it. But they've always been pretty good and the website's always been pretty good um, with the little videos explaining to the customer, you know, we are... Um, preparing for this type of um, situation where this could happen and, and as a result of that, somebody could get a shock. So this device will do that for us in simple terms. So they've always been pretty proactive and that, you know, their equipment is, is, is pretty good. And they're always developing, you know, to the point now, as you say, they've got this auto reclosing. I haven't really got involved with it since then. I'm looking forward to getting involved with it a bit more, but you just got to keep up to date with what's happening but crucially as you quite rightly say you can quite easily go to their uh, installation instructions and within that the very back page of all their installation instructions is that conformity certificate but if they're actually putting it inside now the product with the other instructions of Mitsubishi you've got it haven't you there's no problem whereas other manufacturers it's like you're trying to get blood out of a stone because they either don't have it or it don't comply either way you you must have it and it's 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 in our book so we we have You've got to have it. That's it. I think going back a step from that is that people need to understand they are the designer. The yeah. amount of conversations I have with people when they come in a course and I say, so you're a one-man band, yeah. you work in domestic properties, so who's your designer? And they don't understand that they are the designer. And I say, but you're signing on your certificate, the designer box, aren't you, when you fill in your EIC? Yeah, but I didn't design it. Okay, you maybe haven't sat down and calculated it and written it out and done your plans and all the rest of it. However, you are taking that liability and responsibility. And I just feel that's a, a point we need to raise to people to be aware that if you go and install it, regardless of circumstances, and you know, and you've not been given a commercial design plan or whatever it may be, yeah. you are taking that responsibility to be the designer. Therefore, it is your responsibility as that one man band to be conforming with all of these points. Because that's what you're putting on a certificate to say you have done. Yep. I think that's when you get into the habit of rule of thumb installing. And I've been there and done it when you're doing yeah. row after row of rewires on housing estates in the yeah. past. And, and you you kind of know that it does comply, but you haven't actually done the design to prove it. And there's lots and lots of people out there who are like that still today. And there's no judgment from me on that because I've been there and got that yeah. T-shirt. But it's understanding your responsibility as you sign those certificates that you are the designer. Such a good point. Craig, yeah. I, I'm aware we, this podcast is, is going on a bit now and I'm, people are probably going to be tuning off. So I think we should revisit the subject again in the future. Craig said about yeah. getting you back once a month or so, Richard, if you were yeah. up for it and having another the run yeah. through stuff. And before yeah, we I end mean, this, I, I want to give my top tips to people who are going on training. And one is, as Richard and Craig have helped to discuss, is the open technology. Make sure you look into that. Your RCD protection that you are achieving isolation of all of your live conductors, including the neutral in three phase systems, yeah. um, and that the RCD technology and the products meet the intent of the, the regulations. And if it doesn't, that the manufacturers are saying quite clearly that their um, product supersedes that. Uh, and I guess making sure you get your ducks in the row with your forms and paperwork. Um, and there is software out there to help you with that. I mean, is if we re revisit this again, We'll, we'll go back and have a look at the different types of RCDs because you may need to have yes. either an A or an F in conjunction with this RDCDD device or maybe a B. Um, think, as you quite rightly say, you've got to make sure it complies to the relevant, correct product standard. 
And as yeah. you've said, Mark, when you've looked on the face of it at the manufacturer's instructions, it actually says, you know, an RCC, an RCD2, BS, whatever it is, but actually it's not made to the right standard. Uh, so yeah. it won't comply, then you're going to need to have one upstream. The other consideration, again, that's not in the regs, is where you may be uh, putting a, a new circuit into an existing installation where you may have type AC RCDs and you're putting a type A downstream from that or the, the equipment itself has got an A. You can't have an A. You can't have an AC before an A. So, that you know, that there is a lot of... That causes issue on TT systems especially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is when I have to go back and look and maybe we can put some links into the Beamer documents, you know, applications of RCDs. Fantastic document. Sparky yeah. friendly. But in, in terms and that you can understand better and, you know, some really good illustrative diagrams and pictures because, yeah. you know, most people won't, won't won't know what type an RCD is by looking at it because of the symbol. It doesn't actually say type A, type F. You have to recognize the symbol. But yeah, you we'll, know, we'll, we'll break this one down like we did the test and inspection one because yeah. I think it's important because it's becoming part of the domestic electrician apprenticeship. Yeah. As the draft stands, as I mentioned at the start of this pod podcast for the traditional electrician apprenticeship, it's going to be included in there. Yeah. And there is yeah. this additional training for people yeah. to go on. It is a is a big moving subject for industry. And if we can help with a little bit of knowledge around it all, then why not? Is there anything you want to add, Craig, or people um, might want to look out for? No, I just want to I'll look forward to the next episode because I want to discuss where your responsibility ends when you see these charge point cables being supplied to new builds into a whisker box and then you come along and do the connection of the charger and you're going on somebody else's cable installation method and design. But that's for another day. I think that'll be interesting to pick that apart as to how we sit with that. That is such a good topic of discussion, that one, because that's going to be really <laughs> common now because you know for a fact new build manufacturers are not going to stick an EV charger on the wall. They'll stick a circuit down to a whisker box and leave it there ready for somebody else to pay for. So we yeah. can cover that later on. <laughs> Thank you both very much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time. Um, it's gone over an hour and I know everybody's yeah. got busy social lives outside of being electricians, so I really do appreciate it. We'll come back to this in maybe three or four weeks' time and delve a little bit deeper um cheers to both of you again and we will catch everybody on the next episode thank you very much no worries. Cheers, all. Bye -bye. cheers thank you for listening to the latest episode of the apprentice one-to-one -one podcast sponsored by schneider electric please like and subscribe to the channel get involved with the comments and we will see you on the next one